Preparation for Raising Up a Ministry. <clears throat> You'd think the teacher would know the name of his class by now. <clears throat> um, this one we're going we're gonna to talk about finding God's way for reaching the world. Finding God's way for reaching the world. <clears throat> now, there are a lot of opinions and uh, on how to do that. And most people's opinion is based on some scripture. Some one of the scriptures or, you know. And so because of that, and knowing this, that there are a lot of scriptures in the Bible, therefore there are a lot of different ways that people have come up with that we're going to reach the world. And, and you can go pretty much anywhere and somebody will have a seminar on it. One of the main ways that people talk about reaching the world and that people are praying towards is revival. Now, I just want you to consider this. Does anybody remember Jesus ever using the word revival? No. Okay, is it, is, does that make any difference? <laughs> I mean, if Jesus never mentioned it, does that make any difference to us? You say, well, it does because, you know, a huge portion of the teachings and many churches are banking totally on there being a big revival, and that's how everybody's going to get saved, and we're going to change the world like that. And, um, and if you know, some of you, may, this may be over your head, but if you know anything about the Feast of Israel, starting with Passover and then Pentecost, and then, so Passover's when, you know, Jesus died on the cross, and Pentecost is the Holy Spirit and the Day of Atonement, and then uh, Feast of Trumpets, you know, and then they say, and then the final harvest is <clears throat> the ingathering, um, the last feast. And they say that at that time, there's going to be a big revival. And then God's going to wrap it all up. But folks, just studying those feasts will help you know, this is not uncommon, <clears throat> just studying those feasts would help you to know that that's not the seeds that are coming in. The harvest has been coming in for some time. And they are already seed, and it's just gathering them to a certain place, but it's not making them into seeds. It's not, you know, it's not everybody getting saved. It's the, the, those that are seeds and been seed gathered together. And so, uh, I, and I just say all that to say, I don't know that that is a true picture of what most people think. And they're just saying revival. But, they, but even that, you don't see in the scriptures where it says there's going to be a big revival and everybody's going to get saved and it's going to just end. And this is how it's going to happen. <clears throat> and in fact... There's a process that we're supposed to be involved in right now, whether there's a revival or not. If there's not a revival going on now, what do we do? We'll just sit around and wait for it. You know, no. And so, <clears throat> uh, turn with me to the Gospel of John, and we'll look in chapter 12. Gospel of John, chapter 12. And Jesus says here in verse 23, And Jesus answered them, saying, The hour has come that the Son of Man should be glorified. Verily, verily, I say unto you, Except a grain of wheat or a corn of wheat, a seed, Fall into the ground and die, it abides alone. But if it die, it bringeth forth much fruit. This is no 
simple scripture. This is Jesus' words, and it is a turning point in his ministry. If you will, he came, was born, this is a terrible piece of chalk, uh, and then he lived, and he ministered, and he did all this stuff. But at a certain uh, point, we'll call it at the point of John 12, 24, Jesus was doing everything a certain way, and at that point on, there was a change in what he did. For example, after this point, when he talks about falling into the ground and dying to bring forth much fruit or more seed, well, let's make sure we understand that first. If this was a seed, and this was the only one of its kind, that this seed brings forth a fruit and a plant that is not in existence and there are no more of it, then how do I get more of it? Go out and witness to the other seeds and get them to convert to this kind of seed. Well, that's ridiculous. You're not going to convert other seeds, an apple seed, to be this because this is unique and it is the only one, Jesus said, except the only seed of its kind fall into the ground and die. It's going to be alone. It'll be okay, but it'll be alone. But if it dies, it will bring forth more fruit and therefore more seed because it's like an apple or most, most fruit. The fruit is not just fruit. It's filled with the seed that started the whole. Does that make sense? You know? And, but, but the whole thing rests on the whole harvest of this seed, this one seed, the whole harvest. Don't talk to me about a harvest of this seed without it falling into the ground and dying, and then the ones that come after it that are like it will do the same thing. Can I get an Amen. For, for example, you know, it doesn't matter how long you have that seed in your pocket. It's not going to bring forth fruit until it, it falls into the ground and dies. Uh, historically, when they first found King Tut's tomb, they found wheat seed in there that was like 4,000 years old, something like that. Older than that, maybe. You know, thousands of years, these, these stalks of wheat. And so somebody said, well, let's, let's check it out. I mean, this, you know, this has been in here for thousands of years. Let's put it in the ground and see if it grows. And as soon as they put it in the ground and watered it, it started bringing forth fruit. But without it, it just sat there. You can put it in a pew. You can put it in a classroom. You can put that seed in all kind of conditions, but there's only one condition that will truly bring forth more of its kind, and that is it must fall into the ground and die. And, folks, that's Jesus is talking about himself here, but in the very next verse, he says, he that loveth his life shall lose it, and he that hateth his life in this world shall keep it unto eternal life. And then verse 20 says, if any man serve me, let him follow me. Follow him where? To the cross, to fall into the ground and die. I mean, just stay with the context, and you go, oh, I see what you're saying. Listen to everybody else. Listen to everybody else instead of the master, instead of the Lord of all, instead of the one who, who created everything. Now consider this. Jesus came to this earth, and he only ministered for three and a half years. Three and a half years. Now, come on. You, now, you use some common sense. If you were God or the Son of God and you came down here, would you put on a regular old white robe, walk around, heal some people, cast out some demons, and at a certain juncture say, that's it, no more healing, no more great things like that, I've got to go to the cross and die. And after this, this is all Jesus talks about. Is the cross. Is that amazing or what? It's a fact. Whether it's amazing to you, it was amazing to me. Because I saw that Jesus said, 
You know, I can, it's almost as if Jesus is looking at a person and saying, I can cast that demon out of you, but if you don't fill it with my life, if, you, if you're not, if there's not another life and another seed himself at work in you, you're probably going to end up seven with seven worse than the first one. You know, if I heal you, there's a good chance, you know, you're going to get sick again or you're going to get hurt again or you're going to need something again, you know. Uh, not exactly, but a, a similar story would be, you know, you can give a man a fish or you can teach him to fish. If you give a man a fish, you gave him one meal. You teach him to fish and he'll have food all of his life. Well, when it comes to this seed, you can give him the seed and he can, you know, preach and use it and da 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 and all this stuff, or he can plant it and there comes the growth. But you see, this isn't preached. Because nobody wants to die. What's the saying? Everybody wants to go to heaven, but nobody wants to die. So you say in church, how many of you want to go to heaven? Yeah, yeah, I want to go to heaven. How many of you want to die to get there? Am I right or wrong, folks? Well, we're not talking about going to heaven, are we? We're talking about how to reach the world. Let's go back to that premise. What kind of man, the, the Son of God comes to the earth and he goes, he heals a few people and he does that for about three years or a little more. It was three and a half, but, you know, at a certain juncture he quit doing this stuff. And then he's, he just walks, I've set my face to Jerusalem. This seed's going to fall on the ground and die because there will be no more like me. That's what he's saying. No more unless I die. And he says, if any man follow me, this is my way of fruitfulness. Now, okay, let's, let's follow this through because if you'll just be honest with yourself, why didn't Jesus just come and, okay, here he is. He's 30 years old. And he just goes, wong, and big, you know, just angels appear everywhere. And he just, you know, takes a big mountain and he goes, Psh, and he does that. And he does all this stuff. And, you know, he, you know, makes water fountains come up and everything. And everybody goes, oh, my God, I believe, I believe. I believe. Why didn't he just do it? Why didn't he just shoot up in the air and fly around and go, I got powers and I can give it to you. Why didn't he just, why didn't he just have a big billboard appear out of stuff we've never even heard of that just, I am the son of God, believe. And we'd all go, oh. Why didn't he do any of that? Come on. I can't make any sense out of coming here, not doing anything for 30 years and only for three and a half years doing some healing. And if you look at the globe and you look at Israel and the, the area where he ministered, he didn't hardly touch anything. He didn't, he didn't reach out. He didn't change the world. He barely left the, the country he was from. And it's small. I mean, small, small. I know everyone thinks Israel's big because all these people are fighting over it. It is incredibly small. You know, it's just like the Solomon's temple. We go, oh, you know. Solomon's temple was like 90 feet long. You know. It's a little place. I mean, I, I mean I, yeah, you just go, my God, this is. But that's us. Say, oh, yeah, everything's bigger and better. We just see it, you know. We never see it as it is because we got all these bloated ideas of what we think that, you know, what it is. Jesus comes and he ministers in some little area and then disappears. Disappears for the for the next 2,000 years. Now, you give me one person who didn't know that scenario, who didn't know that, that came a week before Jesus was born on earth, and you asked them, if you were the Son of God, how would you reach the world? 
what would everybody come up with stupendous ideas? Jesus came up with one big idea. It's called the cross. <laughs> and he said, this is the only way of fruitfulness. This is my road. And then verse 26, it's your road. And he said, it's going to take a while to do it this way. Everyone's going to have to be faithful to the plan. So what if there were a bunch of Christians? What if there were thousands? What if there were millions of Christians on the earth and they were not faithful to the plan and we wondered why the world isn't saved after 2,000 years? I mean, it's just a thought. What if they're fasting and praying? Jesus never, you know, I mean, he said pray for laborers. He didn't say pray for the harvest. He said pray for laborers. Doing every kind of thing, but not wanting to lay down their life, not wanting to die to self, they're wanting to gain, and he said right here in these verses, the one in between, I'm going to, how my chosen method, this is John 12, 24, my chosen method is I'm going to die like a seed and bring forth more fruit. And then the, the skip a verse, your chosen method, if you're going to follow me, you're going to die to self and bring forth fruit. And the one right in between the two, between us and him is, he that loves his life shall lose it, and he that hateth his life in this world shall keep it. <laughs> I mean, folks, Jesus slams us with the truth. And he, he could have done anything. He could have chosen any method, but he chose something that was foolish to wise men. Does, does it not say that in Corinthians when he's talking about the cross? The cross is foolishness. And he says he brings to naught the wisdom of the wise. He didn't say he brings to naught the, the wisdom of the sinner. See, we, everything we view, we have this one set of way of viewing things. This is about sinners or Christians. No, folks, this is about much more than that. The cross messes with religious people. Oh, no, not just, the, not just the Jesus died for your sins and now you're saved. That doesn't mess with them. Everybody loves that aspect. But when Jesus said, I'm telling you, this is how I have planned to reach the world, and I'm going to die right now. I'm dying right now. And some seed's going to come up from that, and they're going to lay down their lives. And some seeds are going to come from that, and they're going to lay down. And isn't this basically what he said with Adam and Eve? I mean, why didn't, you know, God could have, you know, created all the world. When he got ready to create Adam and Eve, he just went, world population. <laughs> why? Why would he make one man and one woman say, okay, start, you know, when the next, you know, when, you're, when your kids are older and, you know, when they're big enough, start, okay? And then when they are and... You know what I'm saying? And then, you know, hundreds, thousands of years later, we're starting to get a, what we call somewhat of a population. God, can't you come up with a better method than this? And he would say, there is no better method. Wouldn't God say that to us? And we would say back to him, oh, there's got to be. There's got to be a better way. There's got to be a faster way. And he would say, oh, there's a faster way, but it, well, it's not my way. Well, there's got to be a, an easier way. Oh, there are easier ways than, than dying to self. But they're not my way. See, because this way precludes anybody except those that are totally sold out to Christ. Did anybody hear that? This, this way, he makes sure, you know, it's kind of like, and this is a bad example, but when I go to Cuba, over in Cuba, that you're not supposed to have a church, you're not supposed to become a Christian, it's communist, and they, they're atheists, and they don't believe in God, and so if you become a Christian, they can take your land away, they can take your 
rations away. They can take you, you away. They can take your family away. And I will tell you, I know for a fact, because I've met some, and I've met families of some who they took their the husband away, just not because he was a pastor, but because he was a Christian. And so a lot of the Christians over there that are Christians, that would tell you they're a Christian, they're real Christians. They're not fooling around like us. <laughs> they mean it. Anybody ever see that uh, skit that they do? Uh, uh, Fire by Night put it on 100 years ago. And uh, it was these people sitting in church, and they're in a foreign country, you know, a communist-type country and something like that. And uh, it's a great little skit. Cassie would remember this one. And so they come busting in, and they kick open the doors, and these guys come in with machine guns, and they go, all right, who of you, you know, whoever's uh, uh, will deny the Lord right now, um, we won't kill you. The rest who won't deny the Lord stay in here. But if you'll deny the Lord, we'll let you live. But you better get out of here now before we change our mind. So three-fourths of the people jump up and run out. And then these guys pull off the uniform, the hat, and the sunglasses and stuff and say, we're Christians too, Pastor, and two other members, and say, let's worship God. You know, they just chased off all the people that, you know, well, oh, this is hard. No, oh, God, this is hard. This, this is hard. I'm just, I'm going to do, I'm going to say to you and do to you what Jesus did to his disciples. Look in um, Matthew chapter 10. Gospel of Matthew chapter 10. And let's start, at, uh, let's start at verse 1. This is talking about Jesus. And when he had called unto, unto him his twelve disciples, he gave them power against unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal all manner of sickness and all manner of disease. Now the names of the twelve apostles are these. The first, Simon, who is called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, the brother, Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas, Matthew, the tax collector, James, the son of Alphaeus, and uh, Labias, whose surname was Thaddeus. I, I, for some reason, I'd really like to meet Thaddeus. I have no clue why, but I'd really like to meet Thaddeus. But anyway, <clears throat> Simon, the Canaanite, wow. And Judas Iscariot, who also betrayed him. You'd have figured Simon, the Canaanite, would have betrayed him, wouldn't you? <clears throat> anyway, the <laughs> these 12... Jesus sent forth and commanded them, saying, Go not into the way of the Gentiles, and in any, any city of the Samaritans enter not, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, and as you go, preach, saying, The kingdom of heaven is at hand. All right, so here's Jesus. This is pretty early now, uh, but, but he's, he's got his, you know, it's naming them now. This is the 12 disciples. Here's who they are. And Jesus gathers, you know, He's gathering about him this small company of 12 men. And they're all afresh and new. Amen? Come on. Think of it. Think if you were there. I mean, they're all fresh and new and, you know, fresh faces, you know, ready to serve Jesus and go out and minister for him. Praise God, you know. And... Their master, their, the one that they believe who is the Messiah, the one who they believe is the Son of God, he is about to send them forth to proclaim, to perpetuate his ministry, his what is important to him. Okay, so picture that. All right, so here he is. He's got them gathered around him. He's letting them know they're about to be sent out. <clears throat> they're thinking. Their little minds are rolling. What kind of plan is he going to use to inspire us as he sends us out? Anybody get that? Anybody here ever led any groups at all? If you do, you want to inspire the people that's going to be going out for. So I'm sure they're thinking, oh man, I can't wait to hear Jesus talk here. What kind of plan is he going to use here? 
to, to, to inspire us. And, and what, what power and glory will he send before us to prepare our way and to, to just so that, you know, it's like the Red Sea opening and, and stuff like this. And, and uh, you know, what blessings are prepared for them as they carry out their mission? That's what they're thinking. What, what kind of blessings are going to be happening all the time as we carry out our mission for Jesus? Well, let's go to verse uh, 16. Behold, I send you forth as sheep in the midst of wolves. Now, wait a minute. Before I read anything else, are you getting the picture? If you were standing there with Jesus, are you getting the picture? And he starts talking, telling you, now we're fixing to do ministry. And uh, it's going to be like wolves out there. And you're going to be like sheep. They're going to jump on you. See, we don't read that into that. We read it and somehow we can read right over that. And it's no big deal to us. Behold, I send you forth as sheep in the midst of wolves. Be ye therefore wise as serpents and harmless as doves. But beware of men. He didn't say beware of the bad guys. He said beware of men because anybody that's man is Adam and he will and can potentially turn on you. Beware of men. You need to... The only one you can trust is the Lord and people whose government is the Lord because your trust is still in the Lord, in them. And it's rare to see anyone truly governed by the Lord. Um, where were we? Verse uh, 18. Well, finish, let's finish 17. But beware of men, for they will deliver you up to the councils, and they will scourge you in their synagogue. And ye shall be brought before governors and kings for my name's sake, for a testimony against them and the Gentiles. And then verse uh, 21. And the brother shall deliver up the brother to death. Now, folks, he's still talking to them about what they're going to experience, and that's probably their brother. And the brother shall deliver up the brother to death. And the father, the child, the father, the child, and the children shall rise up against their parents and cause them to be put to death. And you shall be hated of all men. Come on. I remember reading that in Bible school and going, it's going to be pretty difficult for me to be hated of all men. Well, I, I, I'm beginning to think it's possible now. <laughs> You know, it's, it's sure gotten a lot closer than it was back then. But then it was just like, oh, no, man, we love Jesus. I mean, everybody's going to love me because I love Jesus, you know. Uh, yeah. <clears throat> and uh, let's see, verse, where was I reading? 21, 22, thank you. <clears throat> and you should be hated of all men for my name's sake, but he that endureth to the end shall be saved. He didn't say, he that walks through this gloriously triumphant. Do you know what the word endure means? She had barely survived. Now, is anybody standing there in that crowd listening to Jesus and starting to go, dude? I mean, be real. Don't just read this like some sort of a story. Read it as if. He's talking to you. Oh, well, we wouldn't want to do that. <clears throat> Verse uh, 23, And when they persecute you in this city, flee into another. Flee. You know, that's the one thing I guess I hadn't done yet. <laughs> I need to get out of here. <laughs> when they persecute you in one city, flee. To another, for verily I say unto you, you shall not have gone over the cities of Israel till the Son of Man be come. <clears throat> um, the dis and verse 24, the disciple is not above his teacher, nor the servant above his Lord. It is enough for the disciple that he be like his teacher, and the servant that he be like his Lord. So we go, we read that and we go, yeah, I want to be like my teacher, Jesus. You know, I mean, it's, it's enough. It's good enough for me to be like my teacher, Jesus, you know. And, and uh, this servant be like, that. this servant me be like my Lord. Well, here's what he says. Here's how you'll be like me. If they call me the master of the house, Beelzebub, how much more? How much more? Anybody like that word, much more? 
Much more. How much more shall they call them of his household? You know, Jesus said, it's, it's enough for you to be like your master. Oh, yes, I want to be like Jesus. Are you sure? Because he's saying, if you're going to be like me, they call me Beelzebub. And I think, and he's basically saying this, I, I think much more they're going to call you that. I mean, I always marveled that some people could stand there and say, he, talking about Jesus, and said, he hath a demon. How do you look at the only pure, perfect person who never lied, never had a wrong motive, never did anything wrong to anybody, and say they've got a devil? You've got to be really off. But what it tells me is that some people could look at Jesus in you because Jesus was more pure in them than you or me, right? And they could look at Jesus in you and say, that's a devil, that's a demon. That's just amazing to me. But then if they did it to Jesus, if you're really his servant, if you're really wanting to be like him, then it's going to happen to you. Um, and then let's, let's go on to verse 34. <clears throat> Think not that I am come to send peace on earth. I came not to send peace, but a sword. For I am come to set a man at variance against his father, and the daughter against his mother, and the daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, and a man's foes shall be they of his own household. He that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me, and he that loveth son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me, and he that taketh not his cross and followeth after me is not worthy of me. He that findeth his life shall lose it, and he that loseth his life for my sake shall find it. One thing you have to consider. These earlier followers of Jesus, these are the first ones ever to hear out of his mouth what it should look like. Did everybody, anybody hear that? They are the first ones to hear out of his mouth what true ministry should look like. So they, they're not swayed by a bunch of other people's teaching. They're not swayed at all because they haven't been told. Let me tell you, you're going to you know, you're gonna be rich and famous and successful and everybody's going to love you and da-da-da-da. Everybody didn't love Jesus, and Jesus says, it's my life in you, so they're not going to love you. You're my body. You're not me. You're my body. It's me. They still hate. Darkness still hates light. <laughs> and so they're the first ones to hear this. So they're not going, you know, with each, with each verse, uh-uh, in their mind, not out loud, of course. Uh-uh, uh-uh, uh-uh. That's not the way, you know, that's not the way it is in the United States. That's not the way with most churches. You look on TV, everybody's happy and successful, and nobody really ever has any problems. The only ones who have problems are the ones who aren't of God. Did anybody hear what I just said? That's what they conclude. The only ones who have problems, I remember somebody said to me about me and my ministry, they were told things, and they said, this was a person who liked me, and they said, but somebody said to me, where there's smoke, there's fire, meaning I've heard some stuff, so, oh, if there's smoke, there's fire. Well, let's consider Jesus. Let's consider Paul. Let's consider Joseph. Let's consider David. Let's consider Abraham. Let's consider, I mean, let's just go through the Bible and name Bible people. You talk about smoke. <laughs> you know. And, so, and what they were saying to me is, we won't be close friends anymore. That's, that was it. And I did see him one other time after that, but it wasn't very good. And I thought, <laughs> well, on my part, I mean, I just love him. <clears throat> but on my part, I thought, you know, if that, if that concept, that's not even a scripture, by the way, if there's smoke, there's fire. If that concept pervades the church, 
then the devil, all he's got to do is just spread a rumor about somebody. That's all. Am I right or wrong? All he's got to do is start a rumor, you know, and your ministry's down the tube, and yours is, and yours is, and yours is, and yours is. It's just because somebody said something, and they'll go, well, where there's smoke, there's fire. Well, these guys, they didn't believe that kind of stuff, yeah. They didn't believe that kind of, they said They sat and listened, and out of Jesus' mouth, they said, you know what? This isn't going to be all wonderful and rosy. We're going to have to lay down our lives to bring forth fruit. And the people who don't lay down their lives, they're the ones, by the way, he said, if you seek to save your life, you shall lose it. They're seeking to make sure that everybody thinks they're successful and if they do have any kind of a problem, they wouldn't want anybody to know that. You see what I'm saying? They're seeking to save their life. But if you just say, I, you know, my life is Christ. Whatever happens, happens. I'm going for God. I live for God. My whole being has been sold out to God as much as I know how. I mean, while it may not be, you know, Billy Graham or whatever, it is with all my soul and my strength that I know of at this point. And that's what I'm going by. Trusting God to increase my soul and my strength and my mind and my heart and all of that. <clears throat> they're listening to this and this is what they're going to tell other people when they ask them, well, what's it like to serve Jesus? Anybody get that? This is what they're going to say that. They're not going to say, oh, let me tell you, you can make money off of this. <laughs> you, know, you, can, you can, you know, God will just bless you and everything's going to be good. Folks, this isn't just everything's not good. This is facing incredible attack, incredible problems, um, you know. But they're hearing this out of the, you know, excuse my wording, but they're hearing this straight out of the horse's mouth. We hear from men who got stuff from men who got stuff from men who got stuff from men until there has formed up something completely different than what Jesus says. Again, if the prevailing thought is if you're having troubles and going through stuff, you're not of God, that's just the opposite of what Jesus taught. So, I'm just saying, there's, there's, there's trouble on the bridge. <laughs> um, so, they're hearing straight from Jesus himself. And they're saying, okay, well, this is the way it's supposed to be, you know. And, I mean, and I'm trying to get you to just picture that. If Jesus was right here today, and he gathered us up, and he said, okay. And remember, now, consider this. Consider this. He was talking to people in training. This wasn't the end of it. These, this stuff he was sending them out, that was just part of their training. They were in the school of Christ. They were in the school of Calvary. And Jesus' school is tough. <laughs> now, so the teacher... The teacher calls the class together and says, okay, we're going to do a little ministry this week. Okay, you're going to be hated of all men. You know, everybody's going to turn against you. Da, da, da. You know, and, I, I, and I'm going to tell you, I, I'm going to go ahead and tell you this. I skipped some of the scriptures there. I didn't read them all. Some of them talk about that the Lord will, like if you're brought before judges, the Lord will speak for you. Now, the Lord spoke for Paul and they cut his head off. But we assume that if the Lord speaks for us, you're going to escape and everything's going to be wonderful. And people go, we're sorry. We didn't know you were truly a man of God. No. Yeah, yeah. God showed up for Stephen. It was a glorious moment while they beat the fool out of him with stones until he died. You know, and a little off, but just a, a, a still the same... Thing of us assuming something just like with 
you know, that scripture that says, this sickness is not unto death. I have heard that all my Christian life where people come up and they pray for somebody or somebody's got cancer, they got this, and they're going, and then all of a sudden they say, the Lord told me to tell you this sickness is not unto death. Has anybody heard that? Anybody ever heard that done before? Folks, that was what, what Jesus said about Lazarus, and he died. I mean, just, just face what the scripture says. If you take it literally, then Jesus lied to us. That sickness was unto death. But then when they die, we go, oh my God, I should never have prophesied that. Now nobody's going to, you know, well, you shouldn't be saying stuff that you don't get from God. And you should, and, and you know, I'd, if, just joking here, but if, you know, if I prayed for somebody said, or prophesied and said, the Lord told me this sickness is not unto death, and they died, I said, well, it's just like Lazarus, he died too. I just quoted it from the scripture. You know. But I mean, we may, we're all spiritual, and we, but we don't even know the context of the scripture. We don't know the end result. We just grab scriptures out here. Um, I can do all things through Christ who strengtheneth me. And clearly that scripture is saying I can do without or I can be blessed. I can totally do without. I can be abased and ashamed and cast out. I can do all things. But we never apply it to what it's talking about. We just say, oh, I can do all the mind. Jesus is in me. I can do anything. Bless God. Yeah. Can you be poor? No. I can do all things but that. We're going to stand before God based on how we line up to the word of God, the scriptures, what God says, not what we've been taught. Amen? I want to know from his mouth, I want to read it and I want to see it and I want to con contemplate it in light of reality and not just what I have been taught of men who, once again, whatever we hear today, somebody else said it and they said it and, you know, goes back a thousand years. Well, Jesus' words go back 2,000 years and they're the original ones and they haven't changed one iota. Jesus said, you want to bring forth fruit? You're going to have to do it my way. A seed is going to have to fall into the ground and die and from that will come forth fruit and more seed. And this is how we're going to bring about the harvest. You know? So, so if Jesus was standing there and we were standing here right now and he spoke those very words, would we go, well, this is just going to be the way it is? I mean, you know, would we begin to back up or would we, would we say this is the way it's going to be? And we're... we're we're with you, Lord. Or would we say, man, I didn't know it was going to be like this. One of the hardest things, one of the hardest things is when you've been taught some other gospel, some other reality, and then you go through your Christian life and you end up beat up and rejected and hurt by Christians and all this stuff happens to you and you get disillusioned Whereas if you'd have been taught right in the first place, you would have said, this, I knew this was coming. Brother, turn against brother. My Christian brother turned against me. Jesus said that. I, and in some places he said it, stuff like that. And he says, I say this so that you won't be offended when it comes to pass. Did you know he, said, he says stuff like that? I'm telling you this now because it's going to happen. And, you know, you... Right now, you just, it's sort of teaching, but you've still got sparkly eyes and, oh, we're going to go out and serve Jesus. He says all this stuff, and we still say, oh, we're going to go out and serve Jesus. Let's go, you know, and then it happens. And, oh, and it's, oh, I remember he said this. Oh, and he told me this so I wouldn't be offended. It's too late. I've been hit in the face with it, and I'm offended. I know what I'm talking about. I know what I'm talking about. Your parents know what I'm talking about, too. They've been through it. And, and anybody who really served Jesus will have gone through these kind of things. <clears throat> what did he say? He spoke these words to us. You should be brought before governors and kings for my sake. 
You should be hated of all men for my name's sake. When they persecute you in one city, flee to another. A man's foe shall be they of his own household. He that taketh not his cross and followeth after me is not worthy of me. He that doesn't go the way that I go, you don't even, you, you're, you're, it's not just that you're not worthy of him, you're not really following him. Because he said, if any man follow me, remember John 12, 24, except the corn of wheat, except the grain of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abides alone. You still, again, I've got the seed. I've got the life. I've got it. I've got it. So you put the seed inside of you and you go, I've got Jesus. I've got seed. Glory. Oh, praise God. Everything's wonderful. But it never falls in the ground and die. You just keep protecting it and you keep holding it. And so the Lord finally one day says, calls you before him and says, well, is there any fruit from this? Oh, no, I protected it and didn't let it die. Uh, so how much you got? The same thing you gave me originally. Does anybody remember this in parable form? This is a parable that Jesus said to people, I gave that to you to bring forth an increase. And you didn't do it. And he took it away from him and gave it to somebody who did. And, and not just took it away, he cast him into outer darkness. Why would he do that? Because he's mean. No, he's not because he's mean. Because he said, look, you didn't follow me. You never followed me. I said, we're going this way. Are you with me? And many people get upset and leave. I'm, I'm describing now John chapter 6, verse 66, or you could say John 6, 6. After that, this is John 6, 6, 6. After that, many of his disciples no longer walk with him. Jesus turned to Peter and said, will you go away also? He said, you've got the words of eternal life. Apparently this ain't going to be a fun ride. This ain't going to be a, you know, but you've got the words of eternal life. Well, the words of eternal life are, except the corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, the words of eternal life are, Jesus standing here, not me, saying, this is my chosen method. I chose this method. I lived it and I died for it. And I expect you to follow me and, and embrace the principles that I embraced and enter in the same way I did, bring forth fruit the same way I did. <laughs> Jesus said all this. I did, this isn't my... <laughs> Nicole's got this, this sweet little terrorized look. This are, it's not my words. <laughs> this is Jesus' words. I'm not showing you something that's not in the Bible or some raven lunatic here. And, and I'll tell you another thing. I'm a guy that's tried to follow this. And, and when I get into bad stuff, Instead of going, oh my God, why don't you bless me? Why don't you deliver me? Why don't you get, I just lay down my life and I say, Lord, I'm with you in your death and therefore I'll be with you in your resurrection and I'm going the way that you went and I believe that even though they're killing me, if you will, and this looks like the exact opposite way of fruitfulness, you said it was the way of fruitfulness and I'm trusting you on the other side. Here I go. Stephen, the same thing. Bam, bam, bam. You know, we would, here's what we would say, modern day Christians, if we were back in that time. We would rush up to Stephen before the rock started flying and say, dude, you need to quit pushing these guys by saying stuff from the word that they don't like. Okay, you need to quit doing that. And, you know, we need you. You're young. You're anointed. You got gifts. You're, you're a powerful preacher. We need you. This is no time to be stepping out of the scene. Wouldn't we? Wouldn't we do that? We would say, oh, no, man, we need you. Jesus would appear at that moment and say, the man is following me into death. He's following my path. It's not about who's anointed or, oh, he died in the prime of his life. You know, people, when Keith Green died, 
And of course, most of you weren't around at that time. But when Keith Green died, there was this big, oh, how could God take him? He was so young and he's so powerful and doing so much. And one of the few voices that spoke the truth, kind of like what we're talking here about, you know, going all the way. And one of the few voices that spoke and sang the truth with all of his heart and all of his soul and all of his mind and, and put it on, God, you let him die in a plane crash. My Lord, one of the few, I mean, almost, you know. And you, you know, you can say, well, the devil did it. But then other people say, yeah, but God's in control, so God allowed it. Why would God allow someone in their prime? Folks, prime, what is that? What, are you better than me because you're younger than me? Come on. No, I'm just joking. I'm just joking. <laughs> but, I mean, I'm just saying, prime's got nothing to do with it. I mean, look at Caleb. Was he in his prime? He is 80 years old, leading them young people in. Paul, 60 years old, preaching in, in Philippians, they're about. He's talking about, you know, I count loss. I mean, he's talking like, you know, 60 years old. Caleb's 80 years old. They're talking like a young man. They're talking like somebody in their prime, if you understand what I'm saying. The, because prime is not based on youth, because a whole lot of people, even though they're young, won't, because they're in their prime, they won't give their life away. <laughs> but God says the only thing that counts and the only thing that's prime in my heart is the cross, the lamb, and those who will be with me in my spirit and in what I'm trying to do here and follow me and not just claim some Jesus that is not based on truly the Bible and the death and resurrection of Christ and the principles that he set forth that he says, this is the way. Walk ye in it. You know? Sorry, I get all carried away, but I mean, I'm just, I just see that Paul got all carried away too. I see that Caleb got all carried away too. I see that anybody that's got life pumping in their veins, they're acting like they're young. They're just full of life. They speak, they use words that young people would use. They, that words that would roll off the lips of young people because they're just full of Jesus, not because they're young. And it's just captivated them. They are captive. They're caught. Paul was caught. David was caught. And he was caught by the truth, the principles of Christ that, that held him and drove him and, and directed him and caused him to to live a certain way, not my will, but thine be done. Not my doctrine, your doctrine. And you say this is your way of fruitfulness, and that's my way of fruitfulness. It's good enough for me. Where, you know, where are people like that? Where are they? I mean, honestly, don't we lift up Jesus around here? Shouldn't this place just be packed out? I mean, I think it should. I think it should be. I think hungry people ought to be going, thank God there's something going on Thursday night. But they say, well, I go to, I go to church and I go to youth group and I go to this and that, and Thursday night there's some special shows on TV. You ever heard of a VCR or a <laughs> DVR? <laughs> well, I wouldn't want to miss it, or I, you know. I wouldn't want to miss the Lord. I wouldn't want to miss the Lord. So, so if Jesus was here and he just ran through that list of stuff for us, would we change our mind? Honestly, I'd be real. Because he is here and he is saying this to us. Would we go, I don't know if I like this method. And I will tell you this. When I first heard it, I didn't know if I liked it or not, but I knew that it was the Lord's way. And I said, I'm with you in there. I'm with you. That's why the, the season is so long from the feast all the way through instead of just, I mean, you know, why didn't Jesus come, die on the cross, rise up, appear to everybody and say, I'm it. Anybody who doesn't believe, you know, you, and then they all automatically, they all go into hell. The people who believe me, come on. Because just because you say you believe doesn't mean it's tested. I mean, Adam and Eve can say, oh, I'm with you, Lord, all the way. Well, that's because there's nothing around to tempt you. Everything's good. 
Yeah, I'm with you, Jesus. You know? Until the serpent shows up. Whoops. Slip them, as Jim, Jim would say. <laughs> <laughs> and it has to be tested. But folks, it has to be tested in the fires. And this is where the true fire is. This is where the fire, this is where, the, where is the fire in, in the scriptures in the Old Testament? It's at the altar. It's at the altar. And that's where the fire tests you. And it, and it tests, uh, you know, I, and this is honest truth. I know I need to quit here, but the, just within the last two days, I was thinking about a trial that I went through within the last 10 years that I was so sad at a certain part that I didn't go through that part as fully with the Lord that I wanted to. And it's just been a grief to me the whole time. And what it was is, frankly, the circumstances and the attack got so bad and so hard and so strong and the fire was turned up seven times hotter that my heart turned to water. You know what I mean when the scriptures say that I had no strength at all and nothing within me to stand and I folded. I folded. And I said to the Lord yesterday, Lord, there are things in me that fear going to the point of the fire to that degree again. Because I know my limitations. You understand what I'm saying? I know, I know I failed you already when I got there. And I'm afraid to say to you, Lord, I want you with all my heart. And Lord, I'm after you. And Lord, whatever it takes. I'm afraid to say that because I know how high the flames can get. And I know what I am. I know what flesh is. I know what I am. So I said to him, so I'm saying to you, I want to go past that this next time, and I want to go further with you, but there is no way possible that I will be able to do that, and I've already proven that. So I'm asking you to be formed in me and to come through me and to be formed in me to such a degree that when I get there again, I will be with you and glorify you this time around. Father, forgive them. You know not what they do. I will truly be with you in spirit, soul, and body at all times. And I just told him straight up and down, I, I can't do it. But I am sorry. I'm going to pray to go all the way. I'm going to pray to be given. I'm going to pray all the things that's going to bring that again. <laughs> because I want the Lord. And I can't, my, my love for the Lord, my heart for the Lord can do anything but pray that. And I saw where this is leading. I'm going to end up back there again. And it was nightmare upon nightmare. And the biggest nightmare was areas that I and much of it was Christ, but there's areas where my heart turned to water, just, and that's it. I, you know, couldn't. So I said, I know where this is leading, and I can't stop praying. So I've got to pray. You know, I can't stop asking to have you more and to love you more and to prove it. So I know where that's going to end up. So I'm telling you right now, I'm going to fail again. I'm but flesh. I'm, all flesh is like grass and the glory of man like the flower and it fades away and it's mowed down and I was mowed down. And I said, so I'm asking you for your sake and for your glory's sake, come forth in me this time and, let, and I know I, you will get all the glory because I know I'm not capable. So there I am. Bye. Because <laughs> the fires are going to fall, and I know where it's going. And, uh, but I desire to follow Jesus in these things. I want this Bible to, to be more than a Bible and a religious book. I want it to captivate me, every fiber of my being, and me be fully Christ, no matter what he says or where this leads. Let's pray.
Father, you know our hearts and you know our frailties and you know our desire and our commitment that we want to be there for you and with you and in you and of you in every way. But Lord, some of us here, we, we are not deceived about ourselves. We know we have proof from the past of when we were put in the fire, we didn't we couldn't take the heat. And so, Lord, we just tell you straight up. We can't do it, but we believe that you are our life. And we don't want to say no to any area. Our flesh will say no every time. And even if my flesh says no, Father, I say from my heart, yes, I'm with you. And I will not allow my flesh to hold my, the tongue of my heart from speaking. And so I say, Lord, come, Lord Jesus. Come out of me. Be glorified, Father, by your Son in an earthen vessel. See, Father, in manifest ways when the trial comes that the excellency of the power is not of the vessel but of the treasure. And be glorified in your Son. And I rest all of my hope and all of my faith upon you, Lord Jesus, as life within me within us I, I know where I'm heading no matter what happens but I desperately cry out that it may be Christ that you may be glorified by him in us so father we say yes we say yes as much as our ability is we say yes. And we say, Jesus, if this is your chosen method, then we're going to follow you in it. And we're going to believe that when it looks like everything is lost, we will lay down our life and fruit will actually come more than it would have had we sought to save our life. Because you explained to us that this was the way you wanted us to go to, if any man follow me. So we put the future in your hands and we put ourselves in your hands and in union with you, trusting in your life. And we thank you for the results that come by Christ. In Jesus' name. Amen. This thought came to me. <laughs>